584 International Projects. I'm Bella. And I'm Florencia, and we are the ad and PR team for Meet the 584 this semester. So if you followed any of our social media accounts, that's Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, that was the two of us. So thank you so much for following that and engaging with us. And we reached 500 followers. Yes. That was my dad. Anyway. <laughs> um, okay, we're gonna get into like the emotions. Anyways. <laughs> Basically, it's so unreal to stand here today at the premiere that we've been talking about all semester. And it's the class has just been really able to think on their we've been met with it's just a bunch of different circumstances. It's great to think that we signed up for the class and that we were going to Brazil. And at the beginning of the semester, found out that we're going to be so today we basically adopted and prepared for that. So I want to talk a little bit about the importance of immersive learning. Oh, my bad. Everyone could hear. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about the importance of immersive learning. Outside of the classroom learning experiences are my understanding how to communicate with a different group of people. I was really able to see people's passion and drive when we got to Puerto Rico. Our project finally came to life and people did not hesitate to take action. It was amazing to get the chance to share story subjects face to face, eat a meal with them, and even be invited inside their home. You don't get those kind of experiences behind the scenes. Yeah. As a class, we ate a lot of arepas and empanadas, and we had a lot of fun times together in Puerto Rico. Our team has edited and edited and edited again, and the work that we're going to show you tonight is accumulation of all of our hard work and passion for this project. We care so much about what we're going to show you. Mixed in with all the fun we've had, there have been some tough moments. Reporting on sensitive subjects is not always the easiest thing. And from emotional moments in the field to late night pep talks in the dungeon of Carroll Hall, this team has been there for each other. Um, and that's something that I'm so thankful to have been a part of. I came into this class on the first day, not knowing a single soul. Um, and I have finished the semester over the past four months and I make bonds that I think are going to extend past my time here in Chapel Hill, and I'm so thankful for that. So we have put our hearts and souls into this project for you all today, and we're so honored to be able to amplify the voices of those who shared their stories with us. And thank you to our family and friends who heard us talk about Puerto Rico 24-7. We want to thank the students at the University of Sacred Heart in Puerto Rico, Karina, Carlos, Amanda, John Lee, and Ivana, who helped us in our translation needs in the ground in Puerto Rico and after the fact, staying late night calls with us on Zoom. And thank you to our Mays for always being an uplifting voice and connecting us with their story subjects. And finally, last but not least, we do want to thank our coaches, Pat, Brooke, Alex, Ryan. We could not have done this without you. Um, so thank you so much for your continued guidance support. So with that, just everyone, thank you again for being here tonight. It means so much to us. And after this screening, we're going to invite um, our team to the front for a Q&A. So stick around for that. And you can just ask some questions and learn more about the development of this project. So we're going to start our screening now. So we're going to call up our video lead, Angelina Katsanis. Um, to talk about what the video team was able to accomplish this semester and introduce each of our documentaries. Hey everyone, thank you guys for the awesome introduction. Um, it is very bittersweet to be looking back on this project. Um, you guys have a good overview. Hi, I'm Angelina. I took the Oh, guys. <laughs> um, I've had the pleasure of working with this team as a geographer. Um, this is my second year doing international projects, and I'm really very proud of the work that we've done. Um, filming and editing documentary has been 
in like a month and a half. It was certainly no easy task. Um, it, felt, it felt really daunting when we first started, but we did it somehow through the teamwork, late nights, uh, lots of road bumps for sure, but also lots of laughs. We somehow were able to pull it off. Um, it's been wonderful seeing all of us, including myself, grow into this field of geography and 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 learn what how to be a how to be a better journalist and um did I mention late night <laughs> certainly a lot of that um some videos perhaps were even exported like two hours ago I'd say <laughs> not naming names <laughs> definitely um but yeah we put a lot of work into them and I'm so excited to have them finally see some fresh eyes uh they've spread around ourselves a lot and I feel tired of some of this work so this is very exciting for us. Um, first up we have the documentary The Little War from the Environment Team which covers a family of community advocates who combat environmental de degradation off the coast of Vega Baja. Ya a los tres años yo nadaba. A los cinco años yo hacía snorkeling. A los 14 años fue la primera licencia de buceo. Y nosotros vivíamos felices surfeando los arrecifes, pescando por ahí y no teníamos ningún problema hasta que llegaron a meter edificios donde no se debe ni se puede. Las agencias decían que la Costa Norte no tenía corales, que no había coral vivo. metiéndole unos espigones de piedra para hacer la, la playa artificial, entonces iban a cambiar todo el flujo de corrientes de la zona y iban a destrozar todos los ecosistemas del área. Cargarse el país totalmente es mandar esto al traste, porque entonces vamos a perderlo todo. O sea, prácticamente es el patio trasero de mi casa. Entonces yo iba a ir a buscar a mi mamá, ya mi viejo había muerto, yo iba a ir a buscar a mi mamá por las mañanas y yo pues iba con Salvador aquí trepado en el hombro, Mariola aquí. Y el perro al lado. Y caminábamos hasta allí, veníamos de vuelta con mi mamá, cruzábamos por ahí la finca andando por caminito. Y llegábamos hasta aquí. Decidimos hacer el cobudo, la pequeña guerra. Muchas querellas, dándole golpes poco a poco. Y así tú atrasas. Y en lo que tú atrasas, tú entrenas a la comunidad a defenderse. Le levantas el orgullo. Vidas es un colectivo que se fundó en el 2006 por un grupo de personas que tenían la preocupación de que pues, venía la privatización del balneario, Vidas tiene varios portavoces, varias personas que, que están involucrados en el proyecto, en lo que es la entidad. Las oficinas las tenemos cada uno de los portavoces en su casa. Aquí la, las comunidades tradicionales se formaron alrededor de ecosistemas hace muchos, muchos años atrás. Entonces, hay que tener un poco de respeto a las culturas ancestrales y a los ecosistemas que le dieron albergue y refugio a esas culturas ancestrales. Sí. 
el Puerto Rico sin puertorriqueño ya está pasando. Que habemos un montón de tercos que no nos queremos ir, sí es cierto también. Hay que ser terco. No dejar que te hurten lo tuyo porque viene uno que se cree que porque tiene más poder puede sacarte de tu tierra. Pero cuando te asedian tanto, llega el momento en que la gente empieza a, a, a frustrarse y se debilita y se va. Pero ¿a dónde uno se va a ir? Necesitamos que quienes tomen las decisiones, tomen las decisiones correctas, porque es razón, pues sencillo. Si tú tienes a alguien tirándote porquerías al otro lado, es bien cuesta arriba el trabajo, ¿entiendes? ¿Sabe? Y si lo tienes a nivel industrial tirando porquerías al otro lado, el esfuerzo que hagamos 10, 20 personas, 30 personas, no es suficiente contra miles y miles de galones tirando toxoides al agua. Y yo le dije, cada cual entrena a sus hijos para lo que entiende que deben ser entrenados. Ustedes los entrenan para fastidiar el país y nosotros los entrenamos para defenderlo. Yo creo que con eso estamos. Nosotros tenemos gente joven que cuando nos vayamos defendiendo lo que hemos defendido. That was beautiful. I forgot to mention that was by uh, Taylor Holbrooks and Anne Litcheru. Um, <laughs> Next up is Clinica en la Calle, produced by myself and Jennifer Tran. Um, it follows Dr. Luis Roman, who travels around rural Puerto Rico offering harm reduction services and drug rehabilitation to. Uh, um, help drug rehabilitation help for opioid users and other members of the community in need of if the midst of oh sorry <laughs> it's mine i'm a little nervous <laughs> in need in the midst of puerto rico's worsening opioid crisis que casi nadie quiere hacerlo prácticamente casi nadie quiere atender a, esta, a, a la población Así que, ciertamente, hay que atender un problema que lleva por muchos años desatendido, no hay suficientes recursos para atenderlo. El dinero lo hay, lo que pasa es que no se utiliza correctamente. Pues crecí en, en un sector donde había mucho narcotráfico, mucha violencia, mucho uso de sustancias. Sí lo vi alrededor mío y sí vi cómo nadie estaba atendiendo este problema. Y ver todo esto, pues también me motivó a que, caramba, si tengo una preparación académica, ¿por qué no dirigirla a esto donde yo también mmm, crecí? No en mi casa, pero sí en, en la comunidad en la que viví. Y apoyar, claro, porque si yo observo, escucho con atención, entiendo y comprendo, entonces puedo ser alguien de apoyo para la otra persona. Correcto, ¿ves? ¿eh? Pusiste en neutro tu pensamiento y se controla la emoción. Así que nuestras emociones siempre van a estar controladas por nuestros pensamientos, ¿verdad? Yo no soy un psicólogo de estar sentado en un escritorio. Yo más bien soy un psicólogo que le gusta ponerse unas botas, unos maones. Por ejemplo, el, 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 el construir desde cero una clínica. Básicamente lo hice en Caguas y ahora pues estoy colaborando en hacerlo en Fajardo. 
tenemos una unidad médico móvil eh, donde vamos a las comunidades a ofrecer servicios integrados de salud mental y salud física desde un modelo de salud pública y enmarcado en lo que es la reducción de daños. It's easy to be at your office waiting to people come. It's easy. But people who use drugs, people who live with HIV, sometimes they will not come. You have to go. You have to go to the community. And you have to visit the people in the homes. Well, Jonathan, podía ver que era un participante no solamente con un uso problemático de opioides, sino también con esquizofrenia. Eh, Jonathan escribía grafitis por todo el pueblo. This is the reality of a lot of people that use drugs in Puerto Rico. You are looking at a mental health problem concurrent with drug use. This is the result of doesn't have prevention services for mental health, doesn't have good mental health services in the island. Then he dies. Another brick in the wall. Que pues cuando uno se, se profundiza en el mundo de la, de, de la heroína, uno va perdiendo la dignidad. Uno va perdiendo la, de la, la poca autoestima que uno tiene. Yo eh, fui una persona que tuve problemas de uso de sustancias por alrededor de 30 años. Llega un punto en que pues, su adicción no tiene control, eh, este, terminan en la calle, pues, porque nadie puede manejar una persona con una adicción. Yo conocí a Luis Román, mi vida cambió. Mi vida cambió totalmente. No todo el mundo está dispuesto, ¿me entiendes? A apoyar a una persona con, con, con el background que tengo yo, me tocó mi fibra emocional del ver, pues, el apoyo, la confianza que él tenía en mí. Así que básicamente ese es mi interés principal, el poder ampliar servicios a personas que no tienen acceso a tratamiento, un problema bien grande que tenemos en Puerto Rico en la actualidad. Pero esto no se trata de mí. Esto no se trata de cómo me siento yo. Pero estoy tratando. Sí tratar desde donde yo puedo, desde las variables que yo controlo, tratar de sí mejorar la calidad de vida de, de los puertorriqueños y las puertorriqueñas, ¿no? Y de las comunidades. Así que, pues, intento, intento. We have governance teams, Why Not Us, which follows Israel Polpi Diaz, a fisherman from the town of Luisa, showcasing how the community bands together to resist the injustices they face in their community. Que la conexión mía con el mar es inseparable. Desde que yo me conozco, vine a las riberas del río y yo llevo el océano en mi vida y siempre lo llevaré.
este pueblo del cual no se puede separar para nunca. No importa dónde se encuentre, va a volver a regresar de donde es. Loisa es y seguirá siendo resistente. Porque hemos sido unas personas oprimidas por toda la vida. Por su ignorancia. Eh, tienden a atropellar a las personas de este pueblo y de otros pueblos costeros o costeños. Porque somos un poquito más quemaditos, tenemos un poquito más de pigmentación en la piel. Sin embargo, todos venimos del mismo origen. Ninguno de los gobiernos, como yo mencioné anteriormente, se ha dado a la tarea de ayudar a este pueblo. Vamos. Aquí no hay ningún tipo de desarrollo económico al momento. Se han desarrollado poco que mucho y nosotros todavía estamos en el atolladero. Y siempre nos han mantenido al marginados. Y por eso es que somos resistentes. Yo pienso que lo hizo al igual que todos los demás pueblos. Deben de ser autosuficientes como lo es Estados Unidos. Si nosotros tenemos la capacidad para sembrar, para pescar y generar nuestro propio alimento, ¿por qué no hacerlo? No tendríamos que depender de la importación a gran escala y podríamos convertirnos en exportadores y a la misma vez generar nuestro propio alimento para la población. Estamos tratando de integrar la agroecología para transferirle conocimientos a la juventud y a las personas interesadas para que puedan ser subsistentes en una hambruna Yo tuve personas que eran de sectores escolares, los traje a mí y los enseñé a pescar, se salieron de la deserción, comenzaron a traer pescado conmigo para la, la comunidad y hoy en día todavía pescan. Hay que transferirle el conocimiento a otras personas para que el día que usted falte, ellos puedan seguir adelante enseñando y practicándolo y puedan sobrevivir. La pesca me hace sentir a mí un ciudadano que trae el fruto del mar para que los demás personas que no pueden ir a buscarlo, lo tengan y se puedan alimentar del fruto del mar. Y dice el dicho, no le des pescado todos los días, enséñalo a pescar, porque cuando tú faltes, él puede sobrevivir. Mojarra. ¿Cuál es el A Tokia. I again forgot to say the names and I only said the team. That was <laughs> the lovely Ali and Quincy's video. Um, 
Next is the documentary for the Power Grid team by Lauren Camille and Gerard Millman, which covers Puerto Rico's electrical recovery and the efforts for a sustainable future through a new push for solar energy to replace the island's less sustainable and unstable electricity. Porque lo que no pasa en 100 años pasa en un segundo. Yo no, no puedo hacer eso, de verdad. El huracán se metió el agua por todos lados. Esa pared la movió y un caos. Pero luego estuvimos aquí como septiembre, de diciembre, hasta diciembre. Estuvimos un par de meses sin, sin luz aquí. Y cuando se va la luz es un problema porque como yo estoy solo aquí cuidándola, Lo más que me preocupa es lo de mi esposa, ¿verdad? Ella era bailarina de ballet y cuando yo trabajaba, la, la vi, me enamoré de ella y ahí pues... Mi esposa tiene Alzheimer. Eh, como 12 o 13 años con, con la enfermedad. Va para seis años en camada, que depende todo de mí. No puedo atenderme yo. Ahora mismo llevo más de un mes aquí solo, sin poder salir. Yo no puedo hacer eso. Mi Dios es lo único que me sostiene, que me da la fuerza para seguir adelante. Y el amor que siento hacia ella. Pues yo me pregunto si un Puerto Rico alternativo es posible. Y la experiencia de estos años me dice que sí pero parece que no es fácil. La misión de Casa Pueblo tiene que ver con procurar alcanzar el bien común de nuestro pueblo. Y vamos a inaugurar el proyecto de Adjunta Pueblo Solar, que va a desarrollar un autogobierno que pueda manejar la independencia energética de Adjunta. Va a ser algo novedoso, tiene dos micro redes y es el primer proyecto de esa envergadura en el mundo entero. Tenemos un compromiso y una agenda con el planeta Tierra. ¿Cuán, ¿Cuánta ayuda puede ser eso? No puedo cuantificarlo porque son creo que seis placas nada más que una ayuda para cuando se vaya la luz. Bueno, la tranquilidad de que si se va la luz, pues, este tenga luz, te vas a resolver. Pero eso sería un éxito. Creo que el cambio sería el primordial, ¿verdad? Bueno, el trabajo que hace Casa Pueblo con la comunidad, ese encuentro con la familia, de la gente, buscando la felicidad de ellos, encontramos la felicidad nuestra. Es un, una relación simbiótica como se da en la fotosíntesis, como se da la relación entre las plantas y los animales, como se da en las mariposas. La marcha del sol va a ser histórica, va a marcar un antes de Puerto Rico y un después. Va, nos va a mover de los combustibles fósiles hacia la energía renovable. A veces hablamos de los cambios 
que se tocan. Pero hay otros cambios que no se ven que están acá adentro, en el espíritu. Ese es imprescindible para lo otro. Buscando la transformación de nuestro pueblo. Y en ese proceso, te juro que hemos alcanzado la paz. our final documentary video of this screening. Um, it's by Cynthia Liu and Fallon Marr on the community team, places like this. Since, 20, since 2007, nearly half of Puerto Rico's public schools or have closed, including the former elementary school of Johanna Dominguez. Years later, Johanna and a group of neighbors have reclaimed the school and transformed it into a community center. La educación no se vende, no, no se vende, sí. Porque un país sin gente que, que, que tenga, que quiera aprender, pues entonces es un país sin rumbo. Pues fue una niñez bastante inusual también, pero fue bonita dentro de todo. Estudié aquí, vi, llegué en tercer grado. Esta escuela era una escuela elemental que era de kinder hasta sexto grado. Y tengo recuerdos súper maravillosos de esta escuela. Aprendí muchas cosas importantes de mi vida aquí en esta escuela. Pues el año que cerró la escuela fue en el 2015. Yo escuché el último timbre desde la calle y los niños afuera y los maestros despidiéndose de, de tanto. Una escuela con 200 niños y la cierran, no importa la protesta. This is one of hundreds of schools that the Puerto Rican government has closed about 150 schools. School system was struggling long before 20,000 kids. Parents and students protested. An island that's been ripped apart. What happens to the teachers? What happens to the buildings? Y entonces es que nos reunimos un grupo de vecinas y vecinos y vecinas también a rescatar la escuela. Porque pues nosotros estamos sufriendo un desplazamiento y una gentrificación increíble en el barrio. Fue mi escuela y no quería que se convirtiera en un hotel. Por ende, mi mayor aquí trabajo creo que fue eh, limpiarla, eh, tenerla presentable, eh, buscar colaboraciones de, de otros vecinos, vecinas que quisieran eh, colaborar con nosotros en ese proceso de rescate. Y muchas de las personas que también están en el equipo colaborativo de la GOICO fueron estudiantes, lucharon también este espacio. Fueron cinco a seis años luchando el espacio que nos los otorgara el gobierno. Y cuando por fin nos los otorga, pues para nosotros fue como que ganamos. <ríe> bueno, pues la, la Goico una vez fue rescatada, se compone de tres componentes, de tres pilares. Esos tres pilares son el ambiente, eh, la cultura y la salud. Entonces nosotros hemos unido esos tres pilares y lo hemos convertido, ¿verdad?, en lo que es Taller Comunidad Lagoico. Yo estuve como siete años sin dinero. Pero no me arrepiento. No me arrepiento. Para un ser humano poder tener una vida digna, necesita tener un buen ambiente, necesita tener una cultura, necesita tener una salud. Sí, tengo muchos sueños. Yo quiero que, que más lugares en Puerto Rico tengan espacios como estos, 
que el gobierno crea en las comunidades, crea en su gente de lo que somos capaces de hacer. Eh, la gente unida son capaces de hacer muchas cosas. Y este proyecto es el ejemplo de eso. Este, también me crié en República Dominicana con mucha precariedad, pobreza. Y vi cómo mi abuela cocinaba para los niños de la comunidad sin ella tener, porque tampoco era que ella era rica, no tenía. Pues el legado de mis abuelas, yo lo tengo, lo tengo, claro. Ellas fueron las que me enseñaron a ser fuerte, me enseñaron a, a luchar, me enseñaron a, también a, cre a, a crear comunidad. Lo único que podemos dejar en el mundo es un legado. Claro, todos los salones me traen recuerdos. Y para mí, esta es mi casa, esta es mi otra casa. Y sí, me da miedo, me da miedo que nos quieran desplazar, que nos quieran volver a quitar el, el, el edificio, que lo quieran volver a cerrar, que se lo quieran vender a otra persona que venga con dinero. Como quiera, cerraron la escuela para luego abandonarla a su suerte. Pues, o vendérsela al mejor postor. Pero para eso está su comunidad. La comunidad defendió este espacio y lo va a seguir defendiendo. That concludes all the videos. Let's give it up for Anna, our lead photographer. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here. My name is Anna, and I was the lead photographer on the project. To me, this project is ultimately a project about relationships. All of us spent so much time out making photos. I watched Heather spend a full 24 hours uninterrupted with her story partner. Dylan got up at the crack of dawn every single day to go to the beach camp that he was photographing. And I watched Sam spend a full day wandering around Louisa with Amanda, um, speaking with people and getting to know the community. We also got closer together, um, us four photographers, half consciously editing photos in the wee hours of the morning and navigating challenging emotional scenarios while out making photos. Uh, but most of all, I think we learned a lot about ourselves. Um, and as Heather very wisely told me right before the premiere, we're people before we're journalists and our best work comes when we remember that. So again, thank you all for being here. And without further ado, here are our photo projects. Um, let's start. Yes, we're going to start with Luma's Legacy by Dylan Thiessen. Luma's Legacy is a portrait series on current and former power workers who are having to change careers as Puerto Rico privatizes its power system. All of these workers have chosen to either retire or transfer into new government jobs instead of working for the new private power companies. And I'll just say as we're figuring out technical difficulties. All of us wrote um, some pretty in-depth captions for these stories and we don't have time to show all of those tonight, but feel free to peruse the website on your own time and read through all of those as well. 
So next up is my series called Here I Dreamed. More than half of Puerto Rico's public schools have closed their doors in the last 10 years. Here I Dreamed explores the aftermath of these spaces. While some schools have found new life as community centers, like we saw in the video earlier, the majority lie abandoned, their classrooms left as they were on the last day of school. Next up is Louisa, a Community of Persistence by Samantha Lewis. Louisa, a Community of Persistence explores Louisa, a joyful and lively Puerto Rican community. In the face of continued adversity, the community has banded together through dance, service, worship, and education, a representation of the broader resistance of Puerto Rican people.
Next up is Against the Current, Dylan's second story. Against the Current follows Enrique, a member of a beach protest camp who has slept there every night for weeks. The camp was started to protest the expansion of the historic Hotel Normandy, which would privatize access to one of the last public beaches in San Juan. All right, last but certainly not least is Coalition of Care by Heather Deal. Coalition of Care addresses how housing serves as a form of health care by mitigating dangerous health conditions that arise from lack of shelter. The story focuses on Carla Correa Cepeda, who has de dedicated her life to providing health care to people experiencing homelessness.
up next is Jacob to talk about the web development. Okay, hi everyone. <laughs> um, my name is Jacob. I'm the lead design dev um, for the team here. I'm a senior at the school. This is my second year doing the trip, actually. Um, and just real quick, I'm going to talk to you about what it all, what it is that we do, um, and just walk you through the site a little bit here. So you're probably wondering what the design dev team does, and I've also wondered that myself. Um, but basically, anything that isn't text, isn't a photo, isn't a video, is probably something to do with us. So um, the font you see at the top of the screen, that was all us. The, ba the background color, that was all us. The logo, that was all us, although honestly, it was mostly Gina. Um, <laughs> um, also Gina, this motion graphic video here on the homepage. Um, and really, the goal for this team, more than any one particular piece of content, is tying everything together on the website, um, capturing the mood of Puerto Rico, of the stories, um, and finding a way to piece together work from our videographers, our photographers, our reporters into one cohesive product. And not only do we do that for the project as a whole, each of us is on an individual story team, actually. And so in addition to working on this website and designing each piece of it, uh, we also contribute to individual stories, um, sometimes as backups and six mans and carrying camera bags and translating and cooking dinner and whatever else. Um, we're available for hire. Um, but also creating um, interactives, graphics, maps, anything that kind of fills the gaps in the story as well. The reporter might be talking about the one thing, a video is going to talk about something else, the photo story is going to talk about something else. Um, but we find gaps in the story to create content um, kind of tailor-made for, for our, the narrative. And so the first one I'll show here is for the power story. Um, this interactive was created by Clara Mello. Um, and what this interactive does is actually this corner store that you see here illustrated um, is right in front of the house of the man featured in the video and his wife. Um, and so it walks through step by step the kind of technical process of uh, installing these solar panels, kind of the function they serve in the community, what it means when uh, people have access to this kind of direct power, regardless of whatever is going on uh, in San Juan and with the power companies. And so there's a few of these, there's one of these in, in each story, um, and they look different. Please take time on your own and, and go look through them. Um, so in addition to these sort of design and narrative uh, elements, I also wanted to highlight the kind of technical piece that goes into it. Earlier, Pat said we were reporters, photographers, videographers, and programmers. But honestly, it's more like we have a programmer. Um, and that programmer is Caleb. Um, where's Caleb? I don't know where Caleb is. Caleb, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, everything you're seeing was was custom coded, custom created. Um, not only did we have to make decisions about the font and the color, but someone had to actually put it in um, and make it function. So um, props to Caleb, shout out to Caleb for what has been a uh, very challenging <laughs> week, getting that all in, getting all the content in. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to the Q&A. Can we get a big round of applause for all of the work that everyone has done this semester? Thank you all so much for being here tonight. At this time, we're going to call up the entire class up on the stage. And we're also going to invite our friends from Puerto Rico, um, from the University of Sacred Heart, as well as our fixer, Hermes Ayala, um, to be open for any questions you all may have. So um, we're going to get them up on Zoom if everyone else wants to come up. And if the crowd wants to start thinking of stuff to ask us, that would be swell. Um, yeah. 
So I want to just, just thank all of you for coming out. Also wanted to thank the people of Puerto Rico that welcomed us into their homes. I'm going to keep this very brief, but I want to be the first one to thank the <laughs> um, Y'all, it looks fantastic, and you worked your butts off, and you're all extremely talented. And I know I get stressed out. I know everybody gets stressed out, but um, this is your moment that I'm telling you that you are awesome. Every one of you is awesome, and I really, really appreciate you. Yeah, I can speak a little bit about that. I don't know exact numbers, but um, do uh, post hurricanes, post like a, a number of challenging situations kind of converging in this the present situation, a lot of people have chosen to leave Puerto Rico. And so um, one of the arguments for the school closures is that it was necessary because student enrollment has been declining. Um, I think the part that is that you saw in the photos and that that was um, challenging for me to, as on the ground to be there and see is that they happened so quickly that everything was just left as it was on the last day of school. You're seeing the dates still written on the blackboards and um, desks still arranged in rows. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> 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 okay, um, so ultimately there are some schools, like uh, another angle to this is that um, there has sort of been like a decentralization of the school system. They've introduced a school voucher program, so they're encouraging more people to attend charter schools. Um, some more private schools have opened as well, uh, but a lot of the students went to other public schools that were the closest one that was still open. And so um, the government has used the word consolidations um, as, a, as a term for these closures. Oh, yes, the web address is isladefuerza.unc.edu. Isla yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Anna, and thank you, Shelby, for the question. Um, yeah, I think I obviously I was with the healthcare team. You saw Angelina and Jennifer's incredible video, um, and I think what was a, a real challenge for a lot of us is obviously uh, we are walking into a situation and learning about a situation that deals heavily with uh, the stigma surrounding uh drug addiction essentially and and mental health and, and mental health issues and learning how to 
report people's stories uh, really, really sensitively and um, in, a w in a way that tells their stories um, accurately is, is a real challenge. So um, you saw that one segment in the video, uh, Jonathan, the, the resident of um, Fajardo who was suffered from schizophrenia, delusions, drug addiction, and he eventually died and, and learning Jonathan's story, he died two weeks before our plane landed. Um, and we knew nothing about his story. Um, not much about him had been reported before, but talking with Luis and, and all the members of, uh, you know, intercambios in that unit and, and learning his story and reporting it in a way in which I think hopefully we we best captured that was it was it was eye opening you know as you said and 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 a real challenge and i think something uh that will stick with me forever and and stick with the other members of our team so i don't know if any of my other team members want to add to that or but thank you I'll let our reporter Thomas speak on that, and maybe if Karina from USC would like to talk a bit as well. But. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I'm Thomas. I'm the reporter for Environmental. Um, I think something that's important to note is over the past 20 years, a lot of uh, there's been a lot of legislation in Puerto Rico that's made it easier for um, luxury developers and luxury tourist developers um, and like mainland American businessmen to come into Puerto Rico and develop there. Um, without many consequences. And a lot of the time, these developments, they either take resources away from native Puerto Ricans, they take uh, land from native Puerto Ricans, they take environments, um, and not much is done. And so um, our story focuses uh, all across the northern coast how a wave of new development is affecting native Puerto Ricans and those Puerto Ricans fighting that wave. Karina, do you have anything to add? <laughs> oh, crap. One sec, Karina. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so true. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you, Karina. <laughs> Should I give it to Dylan? So I didn't have a story when I showed up in Puerto Rico. Um, 
there was a lot of prep time that went into it. We had months of weekly classes and brainstorming sessions outside of class and meetings with the professors where they told us that we needed to shape up and figure something out. And I still, I should land in Puerto Rico and I didn't know what I was doing. The first day I followed our story team around and tried to gather leads. And the second day I got a lead on a beach camp and it just sort of took off from there. But I went from landing with no story to photographing two different stories, contributing drone footage to multiple videos and just like really being able to get involved in a lot of different ways. And I think that speaks to what this class is all about. You can, you can do as much with it as you want. You can not sleep at all any days, wake up early, stay up late and really throw yourself into the project wholeheartedly and prep is prep was necessary we all like every, most people had stories planned out beforehand um we had pre-assigned subjects like topic areas like you asked it was power environment healthcare, community and governance we sort of still have those we sort of like moved away from that to more like as our stories developed and as you get on the ground you meet these people, you see their lives in a way that you just can't prepare for when you're not there. And that really helps inform you as to the direction you want to go to genuinely tell their story, which is important because you don't want to be trying to use them to tell a story that you want to tell. So you have to prep and you have to find things, but once you're there, you have to just let it happen. We also had a producer, Hermes, who helped us, um, basically every single story team. Uh, once we had done the preliminary research and, and figured out what we were interested in, um, he was able to, he lives in Puerto Rico and he was able to connect us with people that he knows um, to further expand our stories. He was also our producer in 2018. He's an amazing guy. Are you, Hermes, you wanna say something? <laughs> We love him. <laughs> Aramis knows everybody in San Juan. Uh, a lot everyone. of people outside. He's a very cool and interesting guy and a rap musician. This bad bunny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we can hear you. We can. <laughs> <laughs> Those are probably the fewest words he's spoken in the <laughs> Eros, pack out your tongue, I guess. Huh? Any other questions? Yes. Right. First of all, congratulations on this amazing journey. You guys did an awesome job. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> Okay, hi, I'm Liv. I'm the reporter for the community team. Um, and I think food was a big part of our journey, as you saw. Um, I can speak for our reporting team a little bit. We had um, an excursion that turned into a nine hour trip of not being able to get a freaking Uber off of Pinotes. Um, and so we were able to just kind of hang out, try food, try each other's food. Um, our community team, we had the same seven minute commute. There's a lot of asking our Uber drivers, like, what's your favorite food? Or what do we need to try? And I think that's kind of what everyone experienced. It's just everyone was so kind on the island and was going to tell us whatever we needed to try. Um, a lot of us became really good friends with plantains and potatoes throughout the trip. I would say it's probably our two main food groups. If anyone else. Um, I really enjoyed the food whenever we were in Puerto Rico. Uh, everywhere we would go, I would always ask one of the students with us, especially Ivana, um, I would ask her what I should get, and she would just tell me what to order. And by far, my favorite thing I had was the mofongo de yuca. That was my favorite. <laughs> oh, my gosh, yeah. And Pulpy, who was um, in Quincy and I's video, him and his friends, uh, every day they would cook us some different type of food. So 
we went out fishing one day and then the next day they um, fried us some fish and that's what we ate. And then him and his friends would set up like a little table for us in there and put paper towels and the hot sauce that I liked. And then he would let us, um, they set up a little date for us there um, as a little break. But yeah, it was, it was really um, a great experience to be able to connect with the people of Puerto Rico through food. And um, yeah, it was a, it was really awesome. Um, I'd love to hear from the Monsters about what it was like working with the project and if there are any stories that like would like to have told about their experience. Did y'all hear the question? It was for you. <laughs> Look at the chat. <laughs>
question was, what was it like to work with, uh, sorry, Carlos, the question was, what was it like to work on this project with this team from Abid, Puerto Rico? Yeah, Carlos, the question was just, what was it like, what was your experience like working with the team on the project? And what was it like for you, you know, having us come and, and working with the team on this project? Okay, we're going to take a super quick group picture and then we. Oh, no.